quiet, everybody. Welcome back. I appreciate you guys still being here. After two long days of, of, of my brain working through some of this, I'm sure I'm tired. You know, I can just appreciate how some of you guys have gone through all this. Um, this is this is it. This is the, the final hour or so. I'll try to wrap it up a little bit quicker for you guys. Um, I, first of all, I want to again thank everybody here that has come out and visited with us and talked to us and collaborated with us and really trying to showcase and, and talk about the different types of scenarios that are available out there. I've learned a lot of different things. You, you've, you've seen all the different tools that are out there that, that, are, that are useful, our studios, Google, Microsoft, a lot of different ways to, to do data analysis, a lot of different ways to do analysis, you know, from, from the, the network sciences to the lung cancer to uh, talk about how Houston has grown in topic modeling. So there's a lot of different ways you can use data science. There's a lot of ways you can do analysis to come up with the answers that you're looking for. But where do we take it from here? Where do we go? What do we do? And that's kind of what I want to share with you and kind of hopefully wrap this up and bring it back together to, to try to understand what's the next step and why do we do that? So something I call knowledge architecture. And you probably, and every time I use this word, everybody goes, what is knowledge architecture and what are you talking about? So if you allow me the next 30 minutes or so, I'll try to give you an understanding of my brain. And I apologize now for you having to get inside there. This, it can be quite a journey, uh, but I will, uh, I will try to show you what we're trying to do because there are certain things that keep me up at night when I think about our data, I think about our decisions, I think about what we're trying to do. And when I look at this, these are the things that, that really haunt me at night is that 46% of our workers can't find the information they're looking for half the time. I believe IHS talked a little bit about this. Engineers are going to 13 different repositories, if not more, databases to find information. More often than not, we can't find it. Search is a problem for us in the enterprise. It's difficult to find information. There's a lot of reasons why we can't find information. Primarily, it's because we don't index everything. You don't index it, you can't find it. The second thing, reason why, is that most algorithms that utilize and they're great algorithms, don't get me wrong. They're looking at information based on, in Google's example, five billion queries a day. That's a heck of a sample size when you're trying to find information and they index everything. Here at JSC, we get maybe a thousand queries a day. We index 10 million, maybe 15 million documents, which is probably one tenth of our known data. Not even talking about what we don't know that's out there. So when you really think about it, when you talk about a page rank algorithm that's really lifting up your information or lifting up your website or your, or your URL based on how many people have actually touched it, more often than not, when we're looking for information, we're looking for a document that's 10 years old and nobody's seen the light of day in that long. So it's not gonna show up on our list. We gotta figure out different ways to do it. So search is a big problem for us. Next is that 30% of R&D is spent ways to duplicating research. You guys see this all the time. I do it all the time. I can't find, I mean, on my own desktop in the past, I couldn't find things that will create, forget it. I'll recreate it really quick and so I'll spend the time, but I'm wasting time. We're all wasting time in our projects trying to recreate something that we should be able to find, we should be able to use. But the one that really haunts me is that 54% of our decisions are made with incomplete, inconsistent, or inadequate information. Think about what you do in your daily lives. Think about what we do at NASA and we're making these decisions without all the information. We've got to do better than that. We've got to increase the way we do things. So how do I do this? At least how I think about doing this. A few years ago, three or four years ago, I started thinking about how we combine our things. We, we've got all these different uh, tools. We've got all these different organizations. We have our IT department. We have our knowledge management department. We have our analysis department, but more often than not, they're not talking to each other. And we had, we had several issues and several, several things going on. And what really was the genesis for me to look at this, and, and, and it really kind of set off in my mind, it's about three or four years ago, maybe a little longer than that, when I first start, joined the knowledge management organization after 25 years in IT, I was sitting there meeting with my taxonomist and our web developer, and they were talking about how they would look at a categorization of documents. And she wanted the metadata from those documents. And 
the web developer was kind of pushing back a little bit, talking about, you know, what's the issue with this metadata? Well, you know, why do you want it? What's going on? And they were, they were working on it. So finally, I, we stopped the meeting, went off, and I went and talked to the taxonomist. I said, well, you know, let's talk about why you need this metadata. What, what's, what is metadata to you? It's data on the data. Okay, I, I can live with that definition. Give me some examples. The title of the document, the author, you know, where it was written, things like that, the keywords. Great. I go talk to the web developer. And the web developer goes, definition, data on the data. Okay. So they have two same definitions. Give me some examples. Well, it's the file size. What type of file is it? Is it a binary? Is it a character? You know, it's more talking about things about the database itself. Same definition, two different concepts. And I, that's where it finally started hitting me. That little seed started growing in my mind that we needed a group within our organization that understood IT, understood knowledge management, to be able to get these two groups to talk to, to each other. So I started forming the groups with knowledge, manage, knowledge architecture, and I looked at knowledge management, which is the strategy for how we create, identify, store, manage, manipulate, present the information. Those are the issues that we use, the, the, our, our ways of our deciding how we're going to do this. What kind of management document systems are we going to use? How are we going to store it? What type of analysis are we going to do? Knowledge informatics, uh, which is a, a word I'm trying to coin, so hopefully you know, use that. Uh, primarily, it's the pipeline that takes that data and transforms it to our end user. So it's the web platforms, it's the how we index things, it's, it's all that IT infrastructure that's down there that, that allows us to be able to display that information and transmit it to our end users. But there was something missing that, that I couldn't put my, my head on it for a while, and I realized how are we changing this data into actionable knowledge? You know, what are we actually doing and how do we, how do, we do that? Well, it goes to data science. It's those algorithms, those models that we utilize to be able to convert that data into actionable knowledge. Because nowadays, we don't have time to wait to read everything to try to figure it out. We need the answers a lot quicker. Because competition-wise, I mean, people are getting information a lot faster nowadays. We need to condense all this information together and be able to get that answer a lot quicker. So data science combining all three of those together allows us to take our big data and put it into a way we can visualize a lot, a lot easier. And I'm gonna show you some examples in a little while how we did that here, or how we're trying to do that at least. But having this group of knowledge architects, people that understand all of this, so that we can walk into a room and stop these conversations that are happening between people that are talking the same language but on different things bring them together to try to be able to, to be the liaison, to be the ambassador to a, to a degree, to be able to get them to share this information and work a lot faster and break down some of those roadblocks. So if you think about it, here's just kind of a way of looking what knowledge architecture is and some of the components within knowledge architecture. If you look at the whole line across the top, those are the different aspects of knowledge management life cycle or data management life cycle from acquisition to creation to warehouse and again to the knowledge and presentation. And think of that line, because you do all three of those things all the way across the, the platform, but you may do a little bit more knowledge management in the front, a little bit more informatics in the center where you're warehousing and, 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 and actually managing it and sending it out, and the, the data science happens towards the end when you're doing your, business, your extraction of your data, or extraction of your knowledge from your data. And then you have a lot of different types of functions and sources and, and forms in there, and it, all that has to sit on top of some type of IT infrastructure and quality workflow management. So this is kind of more the, uh, the big thought piece you know, but look at this just so you understand what you have to involve when you start looking at your strategy. Start looking at what you're trying to do. And why is this important? The big reason, at least in my mind, is that cognitive computing, we've talked about this, we've had some several talks, artificial intelligence, augmented reality, virtual reality, Cortana, Siri, Alexa, these are all ways that we're getting information quickly through cognitive computing to be able to get that information out of there and it's impacting us today. You know, and we need to look at it, how, it's gonna, how are we gonna handle this within our content curation, data-driven visualization, search, expert finders. There's a lot of different ways of utilizing content, co cognitive computing to be able to extract this information. I'm gonna show you a few examples of how we're trying to utilize at least analysis within some of these. We're working on how we can utilize more of the, of the artificial intelligence in that. We're not there yet, we're still learning. Um, but it's a stepping stone for, for where we need to get. So when you think about knowledge architecture, because I really want you guys to take all of this back, hopefully to your organizations, that I learned a lot about how to analyze things and how to look at things, but what I also learned is how we can bring it all together. 
how we can utilize this in an organization. For you guys here at JSC, you're fortunate you have me in my office here to help you guys. And we do that, you know, as part of our services throughout that. For you guys, you guys that aren't here at JSC, you know, I'm willing to collaborate and share what we, what we know and what we understand to try to help other organizations to do this. So it's just a matter of understanding some of the critical success factors. First of all is there is no one solution. There are many different solutions, many different types of things you can do. As you saw t to the last couple of days, all the different tools that are out there, all the different analysis. There are many different ways of doing it. Find something, use it, and start getting your data into to in a format to where it, it provides you information and answers a lot faster. Master data management is essential. If you don't have a plan for your data, if you don't understand your metadata behind that, if you don't understand where you're going to store it in a warehouse, you're not going to be able to find it later on. So figure out a way to come up with a plan to do that. Focus on your critical data first. You know, when I talk about search, when I talk about looking things, and, and I probably got in trouble once um, when I said this, is because I'm not really concerned about what's on the library, what's on the menu for the uh, cafeteria in my search. That's great. I can go down to the cafeteria and find it. But it's there, and it's, and it's important, don't get me wrong, but what I'm really focusing on is my critical data. How, how do I understand how, uh, how radiation is affecting our astronauts? Or how do I understand, you know, when, when Steve Rader was talking earlier about uh, the differences in shadowing something up there and the, 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 the lowering of the temperature, those are the critical to me, not which, what type of food is going to be there, but we need to just focus on that in order for us to be able to, to use our, all our resources for that first and then get the other stuff later on. In our world, in JSC and in NASA, we need to figure out how we can develop government standards with our corporations, with our contractors. One of the largest, it's, it's a concern to me and it's an, it's an issue, I guess, in the sense that it just makes it more difficult to look at our data. We have so many contractors and they do a lot of great work. But on top of that, they also have their own IT departments. They have their own HR departments. They have their own management strategies in trying to bring 300 different management strategies in IT just here at JSC alone can be difficult. So we have to come up with some type of way of, of standardizing just at least on the NASA data when we go through this. Um, analytics is essential, of course. We've talked about this. And then metadata, metadata, metadata. We must have a way of putting metadata into all of our information. Um, and a classic example I give when I was working within, within the IT group here several years ago under another uh, IT contract, we are trying to find out who all the different people were that were writing Word documents. And you can extract the authors in, in the Word documents. Well, the contractor, it, it, and rightfully so, put their name in the metadata and the properties of who the author is. In, in, what's in, in the different types of metadata information about the contract. So every time we try to extract that information, this one contractor is, it was the primary author for every document. Unless somebody went in there and physically changed their, their name to themselves so that we can see who's writing these things, it, it wouldn't happen. So again, you have to make sure you curate your own metadata to make sure it's available to you guys. All right. so. That's a little bit about strategy, what I'm thinking about, what, what I hope you guys will, will take back, along with all this other information that was shared today, to be able to, to, to actually put this into your organization. So let me give you a few examples of how we're trying to do that here, uh, and hopefully spark some interest and spark some ideas back in your organization of what you're trying to do. First things first, a little quick uh, graphic of how a user, in my opinion, is trying to find information. So the first thing they look at is they want a visualization of some type. Show me the information. Give me a chart. Give me a graph. Give me, you know, give me a, something that I, can, that I can utilize really quickly. And, and that's your top layer of your infrastructure. And there's a lot of different tools you can utilize to try to do that. But in order to visualize it, you have to be able to analyze it. If you don't have the analytical tools, how are you going to pre create any kind of dashboard or business intelligence or graph or charts? Some of the great network uh, charts that uh, Naomi presented. Those were, you know, you have to have some way of analyzing these things to be able to do the visualization. But in order to visual analyze that, you have to have some type of integration. How do you connect to that data? How do you connect to the database? How are you going to scrape it? Is there APIs that you can connect to to get that information out of there? But still, yet once you got the APIs, you got to figure out where's the storage. How are you storing that information and what type of storage? Is it SQL? Is it a NoSQL, an EO4J, a MongoDB, or is it just an Excel or a Word document? You've got to be able to understand all your documentation. So any type of platform, you've got to look at all four of those different types of functions 
access storage, integration analysis, visualizations to really make that end user happy. You got to think about all these things. And that's where I think the knowledge architecture will, will come into play in your organizations and the fact that you have a group or somebody that's looking at all of those, taking a look at the big picture to help you focus on what you're trying to specify, what you're really trying to look at. So here's a quick example. This is, uh, and I think some of you may have seen it yesterday in a different format. This is uh, an application called Goldfire through the IHS guys. This is a search tool. Now when, from a strategy standpoint, from a knowledge management strategy, search is a primary, one of our primary focuses. What are we, how are we gonna find things? You know, how do we do the metadata? How do we create? How do we index? That's a primary function within knowledge management. So that's a strategy piece. So we were having issues with, with search. So we just said, let's go back and look at search methodologies, not search tools. So a couple of years ago, we started focusing on faceted search, cognitive search, semantic search, computational, natural language queries, looking at different methodologies and how we can apply those to our data. Once we figure out the best solutions, and basically it's a hybrid of all of those, to be able to really find what you're looking for, we started looking for a way of incorporating that, and this is one tool that we're utilizing here at JSC that gives us all of that. We have a faceted side over here, repository specific search, which I think is probably the, one of the primary things we look at for an internal search capability, an enterprise search capability, is because more often than not, you're gonna know where your data is. You know it's on this server under these project headings, but it's somewhere in there within whatever kind of structure that's there, because your file structures inevitably end up with, with duplicates and different types of files in the folder names. So you have to have the ability to, to go in there and do a repository specific search. So one of the major functions of this is I can index multiple indexes of everybody's repositories, group them all together, and you can search all of them if you want, but if you know it's in a particular server, I just want to check this index. You can do that within your quest and then find your information. The centerpiece down there is your basic standard keyword-based search uh, to, to get you the information back. The right-hand side is your analytics side, your data science side. That's where you do your content analytics that does this proprietary, in this case, cluster algorithms, different types of uh, concept extraction. Uh, but it gives you an ability to really narrow down and fine-tune what you're looking for. This one scenario here, uh, about a year ago, maybe a little longer than that. Uh, I, I may have mentioned it, but if I did, I'm, I apologize. But the, the Orion uh, capsule, when they were doing a test on the uprighting system, uh, 2015, something like that, they had a partial failure. So they were trying to look for information within the Apollo era documents as to whether uh, there was some type of system, because they had a similar uprighting system in the Apollo cap, so they were trying to figure out if there's some kind of design, something they were doing there that they could utilize on the Orion system. The engineers were starting to get a little frantic because they were, they were coming up to a deadline, they had to make a decision, you know, to, to fish or cut bait and, and decide whether they're going to start a new project, start a new development test, a test bed in order to be able to uh, test the article, in order to be able to go on and figure things out. And that would have put them back a couple of years in, in you know, maybe a couple million dollars. Well, fortunately, or maybe just by coincidence, we were doing a we were doing a pilot on on Goldfire, and we were testing it with our history office, who just happens to have 62 gigabytes of data, historical historical data on the Apollo era, and all the documents. Why is this important? Because we were able to use this with with the with with Goldfire. But the main thing is because what the other engineers were doing, and I failed to mention this, they were spending months and months trying to find information. They went so far as to go to retired engineers' homes, talk to them about the Apollo era. These some of these engineers went up to their attic, brought down project documents and says, here, there you go, good luck. You know, so it, it was very difficult for them. They were getting frustrated. The engineer that, the pro that was uh, working on this project lead, he told us within the first three hours, he found over 200 relevant documents. And the first 10 were, were, were basically helpful for him to go on and keep his project moving without having to do a new development test article, saving them those couple of years at that time. Just the concept of how, you, if you think about your strategy, if you think about what you're trying to do, if you think about all the analysis, you can come back and find a way to find information. Again, repository specific search because they were just looking at the Apollo data. Previously, they were looking at all of the NASA data that was out there. And if you remember, I told you it's about 15 million URLs which is one-tenth of our known data. You know, they didn't really need to look at all that. They just wanted to look at the Apollo era. This helped a lot there. So, 
So let's talk a little bit now about other types of databases. Things that I want you to think about when you, when you go back. Um, yes, we got our traditional relational databases, our oracles, our SQLs, our access, our flat databases with Excel, but new types of uh, NoSQL or not only SQL type databases are coming to the market that will allow us to, to find information a lot faster and visualize a little bit differently. You have things such as a document database, such as MongoDB that stores everything in a JSON type file. Uh, and allows you to be able to pull that information a lot quicker and a lot easier. Why do I think this is important? Primarily because I believe that we need to figure out a way to make sure that our information is accessible years from now. Anybody out there still have a, a, a Microsoft 2000 document that they can't open? No, they can't open it. You can't open it now? <laughs> so, so there, there's a lot of documents, you know, we, we have, we just had uh, one of our, uh, our, our IT developers had to go in there and write a script to try to open up a couple of thousand, yeah, there he is, Stephen, thank you, had to write a, had a, a script to be able to pull out the information out of these Microsoft Word, uh, 2000 documents that are no longer accessible in Microsoft. You can't open them once they went to the new format. So I don't want that to happen to my documents later on, so that's why you get something like a JSON format or XML, something that's machine readable by many different platforms. But with that, you can take that information and put it into a graph database. And that's just where your network analysis, network science, where you have your, you, you have a company that's a client of another company in this case and works, this person works in that company, you can start seeing patterns to develop. And I'll show you how that's useful. Because when you start building your graph models, you can start building out your for lack of a better word, it's a schema with like a database, but it's really more of a property model uh, within graph database, and they're very easy to, to create as well as update, unlike your schemas in your, in your relational databases. So in this case here, I, have a, I was looking at our lesson learned documents. So we're, and this is just a, a, a small test case of about 2,000 lessons out of our uh, NASA Engineering Network Lessons Learned database. So I took the lessons here, and I ran some, and again, which lessons learned database is a knowledge management strategy. Lessons learned is a knowledge management strategy. I'm trying to make sure we, can, we bring it all back together. Knowledge management strategy, lessons learned, the informatics piece will, will be the database, but the data science portion of it is I took these lessons here, I took the content out of that, and I ran it across a, a topic modeling algorithm, which broke these 2,000 lessons into 27 different topics. Um, a, 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 Added to that, I then took that topics and their values and correlated them by their, by their categories within that. So now I have these lessons that fall on a topic that are assigned to this category, and these topics are correlated based on the value within, within their co association with the category. So now I, I can have some more metadata that I can add to that. And what, how does that make it possible? Why is that important to me? Well, first off, I can see what type of topics are out there. This is for the analysts, this is for the data scientists. You can see topic visualization, all the different topics within that information. Here is topic number seven with all the different types of terms in there and, and in rank order. And in this particular case, you got pressure, system, valve, high, propellant, the top five terms. So your topic is prim primarily about pressure systems or, or a high propellant valve systems, things like that. So you know that every lesson in this topic has primarily to do about this type of uh, keywords and key terms. And utilizing that, we can then visualize that information within some of our tools. This is uh, an application that sits on top of a Neo4j graph database that now an end user can easily open up and do a quick search in this particular case for a lesson on fuel valves and storage tanks. And it tells them who, where it occurred, what category it's in, and who wrote it. But if I know if it's part of this topic called on fuel valves and water valves, I double click on that and I get all these other lessons. So instead of seeing a list of documents that you may have found this, you may have found this, but are you going to see this in order behind it? Probably not. So instead of looking at a list and list and list, and generally you may get 10, 20, 30 pages, and after two or three I'm done generally looking. So in this case I can see everything fairly quickly, and this is just a small sample set. It, it could go larger than this. But there's other ways, there's, there, and this is very easy for you to be able to search through in different formats. Instead of just saying, I don't want a lesson, I want to look at this topic. Take me to this topic on valve contaminations and tank contaminations. Well, now I have some lessons in that. But really what I'm interested in is lessons that fall in the cryogenics also, instead of in the category of cryogenics, instead of uh, uh, 
energetic material so that I can see all lessons that are tied to this category that also fall on this topic. Very quickly, as an engineer, as somebody that's looking for lessons learned, I narrow down what I'm looking for. Again, bringing together your strategy, your informatics, and your data science to be able to show this information a lot quicker and a lot faster. Because now, as an engineer, I can spend less time trying to find something and more time trying to do the work that I was really designed to do. Uh, okay, separate subject. And, and so this is more on content curation and taking a look at the information. Uh, and, and some of you may have seen some of this in, in uh, Cody Bryant's talk a little while ago, but we're doing some work with the Human Factors Group and the Habitability Group um, where every time an astronaut comes down from International Space Station, they have to debrief and they talk about the information that's, that they've They'll ask some questions about the different systems and environments on there. How was the training equipment? How was the food? How was the environment? What issues did you have? All of that information gets put into a database, and over the years, we've got over close to 90,000 documents that are out there, or comments from the astronauts. Well, they were spending time. They would come and be asked for reports. Can you please tell me what the astronauts thought about the training equipment? from Expedition X to a, the Expedition Y over this time frame or, or over the entire system, whatever the questions they're going to get. So these guys would, would have to go in there and take a look at the information through the database, pull everything out and start reading each and every comment. It, you know, and that's great. I mean, that's what, we're, that's what humans are there for. And, but it would take them time, a couple of weeks maybe, much longer. Maybe. <laughs> so it would take them some time to be able to sit there and read through and come up with the themes and understanding of what did those comments mean. So we could, we could apply some data set analysis to that to be able to help them shorten that time frame, maybe take away 80% of the time and get them, let them spend 20% of the time to really fine tune and validate. So by applying some polarity or sentiment analysis on the comments, we can, do, we can figure out whether the astronaut was talking positively and negative or negatively about that system they were interested in and how, to what level or what value we could assign to the negative. How negative was it or how positive was it? And then we, through this core diagram, and this is an interactive chart by the way, if we were using more of an HTML format, I could, I could actually click on this and interact and you, can, and you can see it, but this is what you would do if I were to hover over the negatives, it would show me which ones were the negative co uh, categories were in, in the quantity of negative comments to that category. And the same thing for positive. So real quickly, you can see where your categories are negative or positive. That's just a start. We can dig down a little deeper by, again, looking at the polarity of this bubble chart. So again, interactive chart. The end user can actually go in there and hover over a comment, as they do here, and they would get the information, the actual comment. The line here is neutral, zero. Everything above it is positive. Everything below it is negative. The size of the, of the little bubble or node here determines the value of the, uh, of the polarity. So the larger the node up here, the more positive. The larger the node down here, more negative. Everything down here is clo getting close to neutral. And they can drill down really quickly. So if they wanted to see an outlier or something, what, you know, what does this one say over here? They could hover over it, see the comment, and then start digging a little more deeper within their information. And then we can, other things we can do, which, which I'm not going to show here, but you know, because of the missions are all happen sequentially, we can do a time series analysis of how those comments changed over time. Did, did, did it become more positive or more negative or, or on some type of, uh, on those categories, and why? And think about it, this is really looking after the fact, but if we start following this real time, we can start trying to figure out, you know, is something happening up to that we need to take a look at. If we start seeing more negative comments or more positive comments, we should be able to jump ahead and try to get, get in front of some of the issues we may be having. And lastly, within this same, with this, this same group, uh, through the analysis and through the, the ability of, of programming, because with, with the, using programming language such as R or such as Python, you were able to be a little bit more granular on your information, something you, you really can't do a lot of times with the point and click type of an application. Our, pro, our data scientist was able to go in there and color code the negative or positive within the comment. Now, of course, the, uh, we've obfuscated some of this because of, of the sensitivity of the data, but you can easily see in here, you know, noise behind the panels, grinding noise, noise constraint. You know, this is some identifying some polarity across the comments, and really quickly from a, from a human factors version, from the person actually having to read it, it makes it easier for them to pop out, to see what's negative, to see what's positive, to shorten the amount of time, to help them. We want to get the, we want to utilize this data science, this analysis to be able to make their job easier 
and, and, and make it a little bit, you know, this, so they could spend more time doing other things because writing, getting a report done for two weeks that now we can hopefully do in a day or so makes it a lot easier. They can spend more time doing, again, other things and be more productive. So that's another avenue for content curation or one aspect of how we can use content curation within, within our knowledge architecture strategy to be able to look at information. The last thing I want to show you, and this is some work we're doing with, the, uh, with ISS uh, in the research side. So you know, we've we got this little floating thing up in, up in low Earth orbit up there called the International Space Station. And uh, uh, several years ago, it was named the National Lab. So part of being a national lab, we do investigations or experiments on, on, the national, on this national lab. And from that, you get publications that, that, get, that get printed out there. And we've had a lot of several publications, over 2,000 publications over the last 10, 12, 13 years, something like that. So what we're trying to figure out is what value does the International Space Station have to the humanity, because that's one of their objectives, and how can we quantify that? So we're trying to understand how this, these publications or the investigations have impacted or diffused across the knowledge economy. By that, not just academia in publications, but how did that impact education? How did it impact policy? How did it impact industry? Because if you think about it, from some of these publications, you've had patents that have been created. From some of these patents, there have been tools that have been developed, software, hardware. Those hardware and software tools have been led up to, to companies being formed. So all of that is generating funds back into the economy, and we want to be able to show that the value that, that the humanity and the, and the U.S. citizens are getting from the work being done up there is being fed back into our industries. So in this example here, this is just the web of science, or a map of the web of science, which is all the research papers from Thomson Reuters abstracts. And an organization, uh, actually uh, Dr. Katie Berner, Kati Berner, sorry, uh, out of the University of Indiana, uh, developed this probably going on 10 years ago, I think now. Uh, so it's just a representation of different disciplines within the web of science. So you've got math and physics, electrical engineer, chemistry, medical specialties. Also, in the size of the nodes are the number of publications that are in that subdiscipline within the top discipline. So if you think you've got a subdiscipline, of chem within chemistry, and in this particular case, there may be a couple of thousand journals, publications that are in, inside of that. That shows the value of that subdiscipline within the web of science. Okay. What we wanted to know is what impact did NASA research have on the web of science. So we overlaid that. We went out there and pulled the information, looked at the, and looked at the data, uh, looked at everything that was funded by NASA research, and saw where here within the different subdisciplines. Now, I use this, this color here to really stand out so you can really see where NASA is. So within, and, and again, this is an interactive chart. Technically, if, if we were doing more in an HTML file or something, you'd be able to click over it and you can see the subdiscipline and, and other metadata and information. Uh, but in this case, you may have something in math and physics. This is aerospace engineer, I believe, uh, which makes sense with being NASA. But you've got all different areas within chemistry, health profession, medical, earth sciences, where we actually, our research is being used within the web of science. But the other benefit it gives us is it tells us where are our gaps, what are we missing, where, where are our opportunities to be able to do other searches within some of the civil engineering, social science, and humanities. There are other areas that we can look at. So another way to understand how our information is being deployed across the knowledge economy, but where we can make opportunities and where we can, we can work together. Again, utilizing all this information, utilizing you know, knowledge architecture, being able to, to look at our, our, how we combine everything together to be able to utilize our, our data and analysis will really improve how we do things. We, we work a lot in, in, in isolation sometimes. I mean, we, we share our data, we share our information, we publicize it, but many times we don't work within our organizations to really showcase how can we deploy this and send this across so that everybody has access to it and make those decisions in actionable knowledge. So my contact information, I talk to everybody. You know, if you want to reach out to me, one of my goals is at least, you know, once every two weeks or to once a month, I will spend an hour. Instead of giving dollars back, I try to give time back to individuals that, that may need some advice or may need some information or just want to pick my brain on anything. Uh, so if you reach out to me on Twitter, on LinkedIn, and, and I, I try to dedicate, I get a, you know, one day out of the month that I can just try to 
take that time to be able to, to talk to folks if they, if they, if they so choose. Uh, but I try to share as much information I can. Um, I post everything out there. I'm, I'm learning more and more about Twitter. You know, I found a lot of things today, this, this last couple of days, so that I can do uh, based on some of the uh, examples I've got from some of our, our staff. Um, but uh, I also try to do a blog every now and then with information out there. Um, but again, I really hope that everybody's had a great time this last couple of days. I hope that everybody's got some information that, that's helpful to them. Uh, but primarily, I hope you met somebody that can help you and your, you can help them. I hope you collaborate. I hope you share your information and you really start make, bringing together a community here, not just at JUC, but across the, the, the area to be able to, to have a connection or, or a network really of individuals that you can go on and talk to to be able to figure out the best way to share your data, to analyze your data, and then to promote you know, more ability for us to be able to, to get those answers out of our, our, our data. So with that, I'll open it up to questions if anybody has any. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. How do you decide when you're choosing your database or data store whether you're going to go with graph or SQL or document? Like, what sort of process do you go through? I'm not asking for the technical considerations. Okay. Uh, how do I decide which type of data, or database to use when I'm looking at my data? Well, part of, part of my thought process is what I call data-driven visualization. I allow the data to really tell, you, tell me how they want to be visualized. Uh, too many times in, in my early years as an IT specialist, I try to fit something. You know, I just really try to fit it. It, it just became really easy. Oh, look at this great tool. Let me go find some data to try to apply to this. So now really what I look at is try to find the, the, look at the data itself and let it tell me. So if it's something that, that's, uh, that's linked data of some type, whether it's, it's, a, it's a grouping and, and we can show it better as a, as a link, then I may go to something that's a, a, a graph database that where I can show the connections and, and, and how they may be, uh, the patterns that may be developing. Uh, but if it's more structured in, in, so in the fence of maybe uh, thermodynamics information or geospatial or something, even that can be doing as a link. To, I'm pretty enamored with graph databases, to be Me honest too. with you, <laughs> but uh, it, it really depends on, on the data itself. So more, uh, more structured, maybe a budgetary or things like that, I'll look more at a flat, flat database or a relational database. So. Yes, ma'am. Would you please? Great. Thanks so much. And the work that you've done to try to demonstrate the value of ISS um, experiments and work have you opened that up to contractors, or is that primarily a agency-specific service? The work we do, or? No, the, the work that you've done to demonstrate the value of ISS, whether that's through academic publications or through patent research, um, have you opened that up to contracts, or is that an agency-specific service through JSC's KM office? Okay, no, it's actually, um I'm supporting the ISS research group uh, with some of my analysis. So yes, the ISS research group is actually using outside some outside contractors to do some of the analysis and some of the research work. Uh, but on top of that, my office is supporting them on some of the analysis and some of the visualization of what they have. Uh, but the goal is, of course, to then show, sh share it out to everybody uh, as we go forward. And, and we are you looking at some um, um, capstone projects that we're doing with some universities to help us with some of this information also. But the ISS research department that you're supporting is JSC? It's JSC, well it's part of the JSC pro ISS program that in this particular case located here at JSC and all these publications are, are of course available publicly. Right. Um, yeah. Question over here? David, this is a really excellent way of going back and going doing the descriptive analytics, just trying to find out what happened in the past. Do you have any plans on using that more in a predictive fashion in the future? Doing where more? In a predictive fashion. Oh, yeah, predictive. definitely in predictive fashion. Um, yes, I mean part of it is, is, is we have to, I guess, learn how to uh, crawl before we can walk and then run. Um, so, and, and a lot of it also has to do with the type of data we have. So, from a predictive analytics standpoint, uh, there's a lot of interest that I have in trying to, to look at anomaly detection and precursor analysis to try to understand, you know, you know, 
if certain situations have happened, you know, what is the likelihood that this, another situation may happen? Also in risk analysis, um, many times we look at our risk from on, on a five by five card and, and they're, they're, they're up there with probability and consequence. Uh, and if something happens, we, we know what the value of that is, but sometimes it's something, if that particular risk happens, how is that connected to some of the other risks? Does that increase that risk level or decrease the risk level of, of another action? We have to understand that and can we predict what may also happen after that. So predictive analytics is, is definitely on our roadmap to be able to understand our data a little better and then try to come back and say, here is what possibly could happen based on our past data. But right now it's a matter of collecting our past data to be able to do that. Okay. Anyone in the back? Come on. I know you have questions. No questions? <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, uh, not finished yet. I, that's, at least that's the end of my presentation. I did want to uh, um, at least, again, thank everybody here for, for showing up for the last couple of days. Uh, this is uh, uh, something that we, we hope to, that you've enjoyed. We hope that the, everybody out on Ustream enjoyed. Uh, and that you're willing to come back next year because we've already got a lot of talk about trying to do this again next year in, in maybe a different venue with, with, with other tracks. We're going to take the information that we've received from you guys and try to improve upon what we did this year. Um, I'm a neophyte in, in, in doing some of these things here, um, but I, I think it's, it's important that we share our knowledge and share our information. Um, and, and I hope that you guys are willing to get involved and help us to do that. Um, in any way, it doesn't have to be you know, large, if even it's a small way, just to help you know, share some of the information, do a quick talk at a community call or something, so that we can start sharing this information and really build upon the, this excitement and go on to next year. But before I end, I have to thank the people that helped us today, primarily two, two individuals that I want to thank is Julie Barnes. Julie, please stand up. There's Julie. <laughs> I really, could, I really couldn't have done this without Julie. Julie's my event coordinator. Um, I, you know, I always have had a fear from the beginning that if I throw a party, nobody will show up. Uh, and and it's, it, Julie just said, don't worry about it, I got it. And she did, she took care of it, she, she organized it. Uh, I would literally wake up at two, three o'clock in the morning and I'd text her, Julie, did you think of this? Yes, we got it, okay, good. You know, so, so it was definitely very helpful. The other one, Jessica. Jessica, stand up, please. Jessica McLaughlin. <laughs> Jessica has been really helpful in this. I mean, in, in, in the fact that, I mean, it's, it's, it, it, she really put together a great opportunity for some of our speakers to go out and see what's happening around, around JSC. Um, again, I did this with very little budget. Uh, so, so the only way I could attract some of these guys is to, is to promise um, a, a, you know, some type of special VIP tour. And without Jessica, I couldn't have done that, and she's really provided me with a lot. And she also helped me get the, uh, an astronaut to come out here and speak. She, with, with her ability and her connection, she made this really great. Uh, and, and a funny story on the astronaut, because pr previously we had a, another astronaut that had accepted to speak. It'd be the keynote in, instead of Jeff. Unfortunately, he got called away. Uh, to, to, he got pulled out to be part, part of another uh, project, and he wasn't going to be able to attend. Well, Jessica and Julie decided not to tell me about it until they found somebody to replace him. <laughs> so I said, thank you very much, because I probably would have passed out when they told me that, but uh, they did. But uh, everybody else that volunteered, it was part of this volunteer, please stand up right now. Come on, guys. You guys stand up. All these guys are the guys that helped support us. They were moderators. They were, they were you know, some of these guys probably felt they had to do it because they worked for me. Uh, but. I appreciate you doing it anyway. I appreciate you getting out there and, and uh, giving those talks and moderating. Uh, again, I, I hope you everybody had a great time. I know I did. Uh, if I didn't meet everybody, please reach out and let's talk. Uh, if anything I can do, reach out. And I hope to see you guys next year. Thank you.